This is a special episode of the Stem Cell Podcast, ISSCR 2022, day one. Hey, everybody. We are Daylon and Arun. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge and stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. As you all know, yesterday launched the start of the 2022 ISSCR annual meeting in San Francisco, and Arun, myself, and the entire Stem Cell Podcast team are attending. Drop by the Stem Cell Podcast booth in the exhibit hall to play some games, win some prizes, and find out how you could be featured on an episode of the podcast. You can also meet Arun and myself at the Meetup Hub in the exhibit hall on Friday, June 17th at 11 a.m. We'll be hanging out and chatting with listeners of the podcast. Today and every day throughout the meeting, we will be releasing special episodes discussing our favorite sessions of the previous day. So if you weren't able to attend, we've got you covered. We're going to kick things off in just a minute. But before we get to that, whether you're attending ISSCR in person like we are or virtually, discover new tools and technologies for stem cell, organoid, and immunology research from stem cell technologies. Find out more at booth number 402 or visit online at www.stemcell.com slash ISSCR to explore how you can elevate your research. And indeed, we are in person here at ISSCR 2022. And it's it's been a while. Last ISSCR that we were in person was 2019 in Los Angeles, also in California. It was a good time. That's when I was just getting started with the the stem cell podcast and after two virtual sessions virtual isscrs which you know we're pretty solid by the way here we are back in person hybrid format of course hybrid format and i'll touch more on that in a second hybrid format for isscr 2022 here in beautiful san francisco before i actually kind of dive into the the nitty-gritty of the science and we were in you know some of the the focus sessions early on in the in the morning, I did want to chat a little bit about the overall structure of, you know, ISCR 2022, this hybrid format, how it's going so far, how uh, people are receiving it. I think it's been a, a bit of a mixed bag, wouldn't you agree, Dalon? I mean, it's been, it's been a, you know, I, I think for one, it's awesome, so awesome to see everybody in person for the first time in a long time, even if it's only the top half of everybody's faces. Of course, you know, we are, of course, wearing masks as we should. Um, It's great to see folks in person. I've already run into a lot of old friends and colleagues and mentors and familiar faces from the podcast, familiar voices, you know, like Dr. Amrita J. Shankar, who we ran into in a crosswalk while crossing the street here in downtown San Francisco, Marina Madrid and Salino, Amanda Clark at UCLA, my mentor, Paul Burridge, who's also on the show a while back, and Dr. Martin Para too. All sorts of familiar faces who have been on the show. But I, I did want to start off by emphasizing ISCR 22, I think, is really for the trainees. Okay. We've been here many times. I know Dalon's been here a dozen times, probably, to ISCR, but for the trainees out there, this is all brand new. And, you know, to learn about some of the dignitaries in the field, some of the amazing stem cell biology that's happening, this is the meeting to do that if you're interested in stem cell biology and hoping to turn it, turn it into a, a career. So you kind of going back to the, I guess, the virtual qualms, some of the virtual issues, some of the focus sessions this morning were only in person. And I thought that was a bit of a, a bit of a shock to some of us who are at home, hoping to attend all of eyes to CR completely virtually from the, the safety and sanctity of your own couch and your own home. But you weren't actually able to uh, apparently attend all of the in-person sessions, you know, if you're virtual only, which I thought was really a bit of a shame. Um, there are actually, I believe there's actually one session that I wanted to attend, but it was only virtual. There was a, a xenotransplantation talk that I wanted to go to, but then I, I was like, wait a minute. Oh, you can only attend this if you're, if you're virtual, which I thought was a little strange. I get the logistical part of it. You know, it's tough to hold a hybrid conference and to maintain the integrity of the technical situation across all the different rooms. It's, it's tough to do, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I mean, it looks like we're still iron out, ironing out the kinks, and I'm sympathetic, right? I guess they had to have a pretty much a whole reset in order to get into the virtual format to begin with, and of course, that had some issues, and there was a struggle with that, and I think they improved greatly 
in the second year of that. But now going to this virtual and in-person hybrid format, I guess it's kind of like, you know, doing something new all over again. And of course, there are some more kinks to be expected. But I want to circle back to what you said, you know, kinks notwithstanding, and I think minor at that. Uh, and I'm hoping that those focus sessions will be online on demand uh, later on in the day because I know they were recorded. So, I mean, don't lose hope. I think you guys who did register virtually, I think you'll be able to get that info in, just maybe not as you as you thought you would. But um, again, circling back to what you said, it's really all about the trainees. And, and I would argue that while the virtual format did have some benefits for that trainee population, there's nothing like in person. This is the ground zero meeting for stem cell biology and you know, young people who have a passion for the field, this is how I think they can get recognized at whatever level, um, more so than they could uh, with the virtual format. So I, I, I'm really excited to be back here. It's great to see the top halves, a few faces, as uh, Arun mentioned, <laughs> we're running into people literally in the street um, and there's nothing like it, uh, I think, for in terms of the energy and, and building collaborations and, um, you saw that in some of the focus sessions. I'm going to circle back to uh, some of the collaborations that were announced. But just to start, I, I want to just go through briefly uh, some of the, the the talks that I went to. Um, starting first thing, you know, there was a session about uh, autologous. You know, a lot of this, the, the talks I would say of this day were focused on uh, manufacturing and, and really translational, kind of the details that it's going to take to get these cells into people um, in this, this final lap uh, that we're at now with all the, the proof of principle that's been generated. How are we going to scale this up and get into people? And, and I was really interested in following some of these talks. The first one I went to was uh, from Gana Bilisava, who is at University of Colorado, Denver. And what stuck out to me there is it's kind of, I think, emblematic of what we're talking about this meeting. The principle has been proven, and now we're trying to get into a practical means of delivering these therapies. This was uh, related to epidermolysis bullosa, and we've had uh, Michelle De Luca on the show from Modena, and they had that seminal work a few years ago now where they took a posted stamp size patch of skin, um, autologous skin from a patient with epidermolysis bullosa. We're able to expand that in culture and treat the patient with a virtual cure there. And now the, the, the difference here is that they're trying to scale that up uh, in the Bilisava lab and other labs to try and generate those cells from induced pluripotent cells, um, which is obviously gonna kick open the door to making those treatments much more accessible and practical. And really the bottom line there was uh, combining like RNA-based reprogramming with a coincident CRISPR editing to solve the genetic defect and using mod RNA CRISPR, all things uh, that were really amenable to clinical application, also using the spray-on cell formulation, also using 3D organoids to generate the cells as opposed to 2D. So it's integrating, I think, a lot of therapies uh, to, to, to really reach this end game of application uh, next, I went to my man, Gab Sang Lee, former NYSA fellow, went on to be a Robertson investigator. This guy's the greatest. I mean, he's been dedicated to treating Duchenne muscular dystrophy for most of his adult life. I mean, he's probably getting after it in college and making progress on it. But now he's really gotten, I think, to the to close to the finish line here. He's talked about a, a study that was recently published in Cell Stem Cell, where they generated these PAC-7 GFP muscle stem cells. Uh, combining all these different reporters, what I love about Gab Sang is that he uh, kind of applies the precision and and you know potency of the mouse system, mouse genetics, um, and kind of integrates it with the human platform with all these genetic modifications and reporter lines. And the basic question is, can they generate these uh, satellite stem cells that engraft, and and do they stay quiescent when they're engrafting? And then can they respond to secondary injury and be serially transplanted? And, and the answer to all those questions was yes. And it's such a big deal to me because it's not only identifying this therapeutic cell source, but showing that it can behave physiologically and graft and kind of lay low and then respond to injury. So these are like cells that you could integrate and have for your whole lifespan, um, and they can still be responsive uh, next to that, I did a little foray into this, uh, um, the advocacy, uh, and uh, I listened to Michael Peluso who's from UCSF, and this was just an interesting take for me, uh, talking, which I hadn't think thought about, which is a uh, HIV cure research. You know, we talk about the Berlin patient, the London patient, there's all these uh, means of perhaps 
curing HIV. But the question here that he offered was, does the risk of all the affiliated uh, interventions there, namely bone marrow transplant, exceed the benefit of a cure, given the fact that you have treatments that lead to normal life expectancy? You know, the new therapies that are being proposed for HIV cure, CRISPR, CAR-T, antiviral uh, antibodies, you know, it's it's a tough call when there's existing therapies that seem to be working. And more than that, I, I, I love this angle, which is how do you know if it works? Well, the only way you know is you withdraw the meds. And then that is kind of an ethical dilemma. You're withdrawing this life-saving medication to see if they're cured. But in the meanwhile, their viral load is ramping up. And, and secondary to that, the big question is that then they can transmit the virus to other people. So that and a lot of other, I think, ethical considerations in terms of the inducements for these patients, um, the access to these therapies, who gets it, if there, there's the people that are being excluded, a lot of, I think, important questions that we should be asking ourselves with, especially the scientists who are really, you know, raring to go with delivering all these therapies that they've spent their lives developing. But I think we're reaching a point where there's parallel therapies that have been de developed and you got to ask, which is the best approach? Um, do we really need to do these drastic measures for the cure or if we just treat? Um, moving on from that, uh, briefly, I, I went to, to hear Clear, Clear Chose Papas talking about how are we going to finally get beta cells into therapy? There's been a lot of tremendous strides made in the past year or two. Um, we have a you know potential cure out there with cell-based therapies, things that I wouldn't have predicted to have, have come around so soon. Um, namely, basic there, what really jumped out to me was the idea, the scale of these things. You know, when Biocyte first came out with their approach, you needed 10 credit card size implants. That's pretty much your entire torso covered with these things. Um, and even then, you can't really correct diabetes, or you couldn't. Uh, and and uh, Papa's approach was emphasizing the importance of the uh, oxygenation and the, the relationship of oxygenation and insulin secretion, and essentially proposing that we need to come out with these um, uh, vascularization, but also immunoisolation to improve the kinetics. And he had a particular device for doing that. Um, following from that, another really exciting translational story I caught from Kapil Bardi, who was also a guest on the show. Um, and here I was, I said I was going to circle back to this. this is a great thing about ISSCR to me. He announced at the end of his talk that just that morning they had established a collaboration with Salino to democratize the technology that he talked about. And that's what I think we've been missing with these virtual format, Arun, is that when you're on the ground in the meeting with these people, I think it just greases the wheels in terms of you know, really solidifying these collaborations and planting a lot of seeds and a lot of brainstorming over drinks sometimes, over, <laughs> you know, maybe coffee, others, but it's a, a lot of people putting their heads together to get it done. Uh, Kapil Barty was talking about dry, dry macular de degeneration, really the manufacturing process um, to get this to work, talking about the efficiency where they can get one iPS cell to form 30 RPE cells. So, Technically, they only need 3,000 iPS cells as a, a founder input, which is equivalent to one colony. So think about that. One colony of ES cells to generate a therapeutic. I mean, that's where we're at now. I think we've really made great strides. But of course, the key element here is for autologous therapies, you have to validate the process. When you have an allogeneic, you can validate the whole batch and treat, but with with the autologous and IPS base, you got to validate that process, and that's very laborious. The end game there, and this was a session about AI and how it can in, um, integrate and synergize with all these approaches. And, and the end game here was looking at AI as a functional test. They had this trans epithelial electri electrical resistance method for testing the functionality of these cells. And this is where I think it's interesting, Arun. I'd love to get your input on this. They train an AI, so they use the machine learning with 10,000 more images of cell diffs, just bright field cell diff images. Um, and then the, the AI gets trained uh, with a known input of functional or not a non-functional based on this uh, trans epithelial electric resistance. And then the AI just figures out based on some parameters that we don't know which of these correlates, or, you know, what morphologies or whatever correlates with good function. And this was such a twist for me because uh, Kapil said, he kept saying that, quote, we don't understand what the AI is seeing, but it works. And that was just a twist to me, because that's like some Skynet type ass, <laughs> where it's just like, yeah, the AI is taking over. We don't even know what it's doing. Um, and there were some questions from the audience there about like, 
you know, maybe we should try and figure out mechanistically what, what the hell is this AI looking at um, so that we can really understand why and, and how uh, that, that judgment is made. And, and uh, Dr. Barty did acknowledge this in the Q&A. And then finally, I just want to talk about this, uh, I think, exciting, just technical approach, again, emblematic of how we're just kind of ironing out the nuts and bolts now for the last lap to therapy. This is Robert Zwigart from uh, Hanover. And he was talking about this high density manufacturing and bioprocessing. And what I loved about it was this fundamental approach uh, that I think could be uh, applied to any kind of cell, you know, a specific end, end cell, uh, end point, um, any process where they had this kind of feedback control where they would monitor, for instance, the pH. When they get high proliferation, they get exhaustion in the media and it decreases the pH, it's acidic. So they would do this base supplementation. Similarly, when the oxygen uh, O2 saturation drop, they do O2 supplementation. When the aggregates got too big, they had this increased stirring. They would stir more to keep the aggregates smaller. And what it amounted to end game when you've got all these supplementations in is that they could get a tenfold increase in the amount of cells. And I know that doesn't seem crazy, but when you're talking about biomanufacturing, that's really the critical factor here. Can you scale? And also economically, how much media do you have to use in order to generate that? And so this was, I think, a, a big um, step forward and a great demonstration of how this a process of biomanufacturing could be modulated with this continual recursive feedback um, in order to optimize the culture. So I, I know it's a lot of talks I just went over there, but that was really just a fraction of all these focus sessions and, and it just shows you how much great science is going on in this meeting, Arun. And we're just on day one, morning one. I mean, what do you think? What was your, what was your take? Yeah, absolutely. I had phenomenal focus sessions to get things started off here in the morning, Wednesday morning. I think there were six or seven that were actually happening in parallel of these focus sessions. I actually was mostly in the tools for basic and applied stem cell biology session, which was, I think, a fantastic overview of all the different amazing tools that are emerging in our field that are able to take stem cell biology, basic stem cell biology, and translational stem cell biology to the next level. And that included a lot of CRISPR, uh, next generation genome editing, like prime editing, fluorescently tagged IPS lines, which I'll get to in a minute, um, and a lot of optimization of hypoimmune IPS cell types, which was actually a highlight of the, the second plenary for me as well. So, you know, I'll start things off with, uh, you know, some of the, the, the work covered by uh, Laura Bat Batille from the CoreU STEM network. This, she was basically overviewing the CoreU STEM network and how it's a really phenomenal investigator-led network uh, for stem cell research over there in Europe. It was a nice transition into some of the, the work that Ting Zhou is actually doing stateside at Sloan Kettering, focusing more on editing, prime editing. This is a really next generation genome editing technology that's free of inducing a double-stranded break and it's free a lot of, of a lot of the limitations of Cas9. And she was talking a little bit about their adventures in prime editing and how they've had some, you know, improvements in the amounts of editing that you can get using this cleaner prime editing based approach. I was a, a, a little, you know, I, I don't want to say disappointed. I was still impressed by the improvements in prime editing over standard Cas9. But when they talked about some of their initial IPS clones that they're able to only generate using prime editing, I, I thought the numbers would be even more astounding in terms of the improvement. So they gave one example of a gene where they're able to only create, I believe, three clones out of 96 possible clones that they screened that actually had the genetic mutation that they wanted. And then they said that after trying the same approach instead of using Cas9, but it, using prime editing instead, they upped the number to double, so like six or seven clones out of 96. Hmm. And then you can further improve that using the P53 inhibitors that uh, Ting Zhou talked about. Uh, but you know, again, single digit numbers of clones, I still think we still we have a long way to go to get amazingly efficient prime editing, genome editing in IPS lines. You know, the dream is to have 
whatever cell type, whatever gene, whatever gene you're interested in editing in whatever IPS line, and you can create those clones, those edits in greater than 50% of the clones that you screen. Okay. That that's the ultimate dream. I don't think we're there yet. Prime editing, genome editing is so much a case and situation dependent scenario. Some genes are just easier to edit than other genes. I found this out the, the very hard way. So going into a little bit more with gene editing from Dmitry Achinnikov over at the University of Melbourne in Australia. Uh, again, looking at you know evolving gene editing and functionalities in human pluripotent stem cells, uh, talking a little bit about their forays into using custom assembloids, really neat fluorescent imaging uh, in, in, these, in that particular talk. Uh, Omer Farah, uh, and then going into Brock Roberts. Actually, this is one of my favorites because Brock Roberts is over at the Allen Institute for Cell Science. And we actually chatted with uh, Ruben Wardane over on the, the podcast not too long ago. And he was, you know, Doc, Brock Roberts was actually talking specifically about their amazing compendium of fluorescent reporter IPS lines that they have over at the Allen Institute, which are available for the community to use. I've used some of them myself, honestly, and they are just cranking these things out. They have some custom endothelial reporters, I believe, that are coming out, IPS-derived ECs. So definitely check out the Allen Institute's um, cell lines, custom IPS fluorescent reporter lines. Um, some other talks by, you know, briefly uh, an introduction from Lorenz de Heron over at Harvard, one of the pioneers in terms of IPS cores. Harvard has a really phenomenal IPS core over there. Um, I actually jumped over to the advocacy session as well, and I managed to listen on a very, very touching, very powerful talk from Nancy Renee, who is a patient advocate for CIRM, the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, uh, was giving a really powerful story about sickle cell patients and how there's really a shortage of doctors in California and really around the world who are treating specifically sickle cell afflicted individuals you know, with the, with the sickle cell trait, sickle cell anemia, which unfortunately predominantly affects the African-American community. And she says there still needs to be a lot of work that happens in medical education, general scientific education about sickle cell and how, um, you know, we can improve the, the quality of lives for, for these particular individuals. So really, uh, you know, a phenomenal set of introductions, introductory talks in these uh, focus sessions in the morning. And then we had the, of course, the, the big kickoff, which is plenary number one. Yeah, plenary number one is always my favorite uh, because it's the award session, right? And there's also a bunch of sentimental stuff that the, you know, the president of the last year uh, reviews there the challenges they faced and what they accomplished. And then, you know, it's, it's a big love fest. Um, this year, the Susan Lim Young Investigator Award went to Jennifer Phillips Kremens, who's, I mean, amazingly fluent in her description of her work. She, in Plenary 2, talked about her, uh, her work on repeat expansion diseases. Um, and wow, she really is a, a, a force to be reckoned with. I can't wait to see uh, how her career goes. And of course, there was the Public Service Award went to Sean Morrison. I mean, I'm not complaining because these guys are all luminaries, but they, a lot of times they're just passing these awards around to each other, you know, and the, the same, the same familiar faces you see every year, a few of them get the award, but it's well-deserved in his case. Sean Morrison, you know, he's been at the center um, as an advocate uh, and as a, you know, interfacing with regulatory bodies. Uh, he's been a really great, uh, uh, advocate and and spokesperson for the field for all of us. So he gave a great little some some nice words talking about the challenge we face and the progress we've made. Um, of course, you know, interspersed with all the talks here, you you love to see the the messages from former presidents. A couple of highlights for me was of course Hans Clevers is always somewhere in the woods, <laughs> wandering, wandering around sharing his thoughts uh, and <laughs> honestly, so entertaining. There's just something about his energy. I mean, I, I love that guy. Yeah. Um, and also I had to laugh because I don't know, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I saw in Rusty Gage's little sentiments there, there were four uh, framed portraits <laughs> behind him. I think they were all of him in different poses. So Rusty, I mean, come on, the vanity on you, just messing with you, my man. There's probably some other people in those portraits too, but you're not hard to look at. So I wouldn't blame you if you wanted to line your wall with all your best of. Um, but yeah, then we got into the nitty gritty lens on, talked about stem cell clonality, that's his thing, you know, endothelial uh, cuddling and macrophages. He loves to talk about that stuff. 
in the fish. Um, he had a nice photo tour, the history, looking at some pictures from 10 years ago, 20 years ago, the beginnings of ISSCR, so cool. Finished with some crazy flex of parabiosis in fish. I mean, mm -hmm. now I've seen it all when you got two fish parabiosing, that's nuts. Um, there was also uh, uh, talks from some really, uh, I think, uh, accomplished uh, investigators of all stripes. Jose Polo Adelaide, who talked about, um, you know, reprogramming, um, but as a segue into eye blastoids and how about these intermediate states, Aria Warm Flash uh, talked about gas relation, these fundamental cell patterning events. He, he, he explained and uh, described some of these great tools that he's utilized. And I'm just waiting because I look at his work and as, as a tremendously progressive as it is, it's still 2D. I'm waiting for him to integrate his, his uh, patterning and morphogen analysis into a 3D system. And that's going to be bonkers. He's probably already working on it. Um, and yeah, I mean, my takeaway there is that you saw these immaculately patterned with the, he uses a, a matrix and all this stuff to get it going, but he just he plants the seed and it just goes to show, I think that biology does a much better job of patterning than engineering can. Um, and I think that's, that's a kind of a, an idea that's taking root that maybe isn't new. Um, then uh, Prisca Liberali uh, from Switzerland talking about, talking about our use of intestinal organoids as a, a model of tissue organization. And for me there, the big, big breakthrough there was just this idea of symmetry breaking as, as the key, as the nidus of pattern formation. You had to break symmetry and she had some nice data to that point. Um, and then Christine Mummery uh, finished the session with a really nice reflection, I thought, on the progress uh, that, that we've made. Um, and, you know, circling back to your point about the prime editing and the, you know, I guess kind of disappointing in terms of the jump in efficiency, but, uh, Dr. Mummery alluded to this great progress you made and reminded me at least of how back in the day, you know, when we were in, even in San Francisco for the last meeting, or I was at a meeting in San Francisco last time and the stuff we were talking about it seemed pretty archaic when you look at where we are now, you know, talking about equivalent, let's say 3% efficiency of differentiation to, to beating cardiac, uh, you know, uh, uh, embryoid bodies are, are 3% efficiency in the whole culture that were cardiac troponopositive. So I, I like to think that similarly, this prime editing is going to get amped up as we optimize it. Um, and on the science end of it, I thought she made a really good point using these multi-lineage organoids where she can um, control uh, the inputs there and, and showed there in, in uh, I think a really important study that the cardiac fibroblast in the context of one disease um, is really central to, to a phenotype that uh, presents in the cardiomyocytes. So not a brand new idea, but I think some really nice evidence to support the, this key and, and seminal notion that all the cells contribute to the function of an organ. In this case, the fibroblast may be the target if we want to address disease. So I thought a really strong uh, opening to the conference. The energy was high. There was a lot of back slapping um, and a love fest. Like I said, like I said, twenty years on, I think though it's it's well deserved. Uh, the ISSCR is an incredible institution, an organization that's really, really changed lives and changed the nature of of science and research. So I, I, I was just excited to be in the room. The room. Me too, man. Happy 20th birthday, oh, ISCR. You. you know, 20th oh, birthday. You're, wow. You're saying happy birthday. I thought you are saying happy birthday to me. Right? <laughs> happy birthday, Dale. <laughs> you're, you're definitely not 20, though. I will say that. But yes, happy 20th birthday to the ISCR. I think part of what you said, you know, reflects on the pride that these former presidents have for this really unique organization. I think every single president, it seemed like, came back and gave some sort of video address to the crowd about, you know, ICCR and how much it's meant to them and their research and their, the, the community as a whole. Uh, I think the, the public service award to Sean Morrison was very well-deserved. He's been so prominent in the fight against bad, bad actors, as he said, quote unquote, unscrupulous actors, mm -hmm. which have unfortunately been associated with the stem cell community folks, you know, people who have tried to take the science that we do, the good science that we do and turn it on its head and then, you know, uh, turn it into a, something that's not, <laughs> that, that's not the best representation of the, the good work that we're doing here in the community. 
So I think he's been really great in trying to combat some of that negative perception. Plenty of congratulations, like you said. Len Zahn, the very first president of the ICCR, gave some a couple of really great stories and also a nice set of pictures from the first ICCR ever back in Washington, D.C. in 2003. Some pictures from that first meeting of, you know, all the different dignitaries, a, a little bit younger, you know, a little wiser now, I suppose. Um, also, a unique quip that at the 10th meeting, the 10th ISSCR, Len Zahn was put under a lot of pressure in Japan because his uh, plenary address was a speech in front of the emperor of Japan. Now, I don't think that's something I would ever be able to do, but Len Zahn handled it beautifully, I'm sure. So, you know, he, he got into a little bit more of his, his, you know, science as well, which a lot of us are familiar with, um, trainees, certainly. I think this is perhaps their first exposure to some of the amazing zebrafish and hematopoietic stem cell biology that Len Zahn does in his lab in, in Boston Children's some really awesome animations of blood stem cells doing their thing in zebrafish, this concept of twister allowing for genetic studies of blood stem cells and their national natural niche. And of course the concept of fish parabiosis, hmm. who would have, who would have thought, right? Moving on to Hans Cleavers in the woods as usual, and, you know, carrying on from last year, but yes, also a hearty congratulations from him. Joseph Polo, you know, focusing on some of his eye blastoid work. I think this has really been a focus this year, also last year, some of these early embryo models and how powerful they have been to study early embryo development, perhaps serve as new tools for screening for better compounds, regulating IVF, for example. Uh, so yeah, he was talking about all of his blastoid work and how uh, importantly, I think this is a really important point. He mentioned that the cells the different types of cells that are found in these artificial blastoids, such as the ones from the Polo group, also the ones from the, the Wu group, Jun Wu's group, they're, they're all pretty similar. They're pretty consistent. So that's promising. It doesn't matter if you generate these blastoids through a micro pattern based approach or a different approach, the ultimately the, the cells that are found in these blastoids you know, the trophectoderm, all the different cell types you'd normally find in, 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 in blastocysts, they're, they're there, which is great. So um, fantastic talk there. Uh, Christine Mummery, obviously, it's a, always a highlight for me as a cardiac biologist, you know, talking about some of her models of cardiac maturation and three-dimensional micro tissues, how that may be able to better recapitulate uh, drug screening, drug toxicity screening. She is a, a, a mainstay in the ISCR community, of course, one of the past presidents, actually one of the immediate past presidents. Uh, she has a number of different posters from her group that are talking about all the different disease modeling approaches, cardiac disease modeling, three-dimensional organoid production, micro tissue production that they, you know, that they're going to be talking about here at, you know, the ISCR conference. And I, I wanted to emphasize one thing before we get into plenary number two, I think you know, definitely follow along online if you're able to, especially on Twitter. Hashtag ISCR 2022 is quite active. I see a lot, I mean, a lot of trainees posting about their poster sessions and saying, oh, come see me in my poster session on Friday evening. I'm poster number one, two, three, or whatever. Um, that's really, really important to help get these trainees some exposure to their science. And I speak from personal experience. A lot of times, this is how these junior investigators, these trainees can get their future jobs, right? You can present a poster, do a great job, and you might never know the person you're presenting to is a PI who you might end up working for. So definitely shout out to the trainees. Definitely take a look at the the, the Twitter hashtag ICR 22, 2022. It's got a bunch of good stuff on there. Yes, emphasize that. And, and trainees, come by the booth. If you're listening to this while the, 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 the conference is still active, you should come by the booth and, and get, your, get your name out there on the street. We invite you as a delegate to, to record something for the podcast in the media room, okay? So if you guys are listening, it's a good way uh, to, to get a little recognition, and we'd love to hear from you. On to plenary two. I'm going to kick this one to you, Arun, because I, I think you really had the interest and the emphasis on, on the immunotherapies. But I, I, I will just say this, apart from um, Dr. Kremens, who, as I said, gave such a, a fluent, I mean, just such a great speaker. 
uh, I was just overwhelmed. Uh, I really suggest that you guys, I'm not really deep on the repeat expansion diseases. Like it was a, a bit over my head um, in terms of like origins or replication, all that stuff. But just, she got me into it. Some I didn't even know that I loved uh, hearing from her really uh, planted that seed. But um, I'm going to kick it to you and for the immunotherapies, because I think that was also emblematic of how close we are to amazing therapeutic applications that are based on, you know, the 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 promise that we've been squawking about for decades now, and I think we're right there. So tell me about your take on these uh, immunotherapies and the immune evasion, et cetera, with the iPSCs. I mean, these the, the self-described not as stem cell biologists, more as immunobiologists, disclaiming that at the beginning of both of their talks. But I mean, as far as I'm concerned, this is one of the most exciting applications of pluripotent stem cells. So I loved those talks, Arun. How about you? Hundred percent. I mean, perhaps it's because it's something a little bit different from what we're used to as stem cell biologists. We had a couple of immunologists focus folks who are perhaps future guests for the the immunology podcast, right? You know, shameless plug there. Um, first off, you know, deep to Bhattacharya from the University of Arizona, engineering pluripotent stem cells to evade and promote immunity. Right. I mean, really cool examples, some extremely potent protective immune responses against, you know, West Nile virus and HIV, for example, in some of their serum based studies that they've done. Uh, these are tough pathogens to crack, but they're hoping to get some universal donor ES cell lines, these hypoimmune pluripotent stem cells that might even be able to cross xeno barriers, right? Some of these human ESCs that can survive transplant into mice. So really cool next generation stuff. Yvonne Chen over at UCLA, engineering next gen CAR T for cancer immunotherapy, these bi-specific CD19, CD20 dual targeting cars, which are, I think, really nifty. Not a whole lot of stem cell biology in there, but she did mention that perhaps some of these cars can be IPS derived down the road. So those are just a couple of highlights for me in plenary number two. Of course, we also had Deepak Srivastava and uh, Malin Parmar talking about all their forays into basic cardiac modeling using IPSCs and also um, stem cell derived dopaminergic neurons for cell therapy and Parkinson's. So I think overall, just a phenomenal start to ISCR 2022. Yes, a full and honest day, Arun, and I really enjoyed it. It was a great way to commence this meeting. Uh, and that brings us to the end of our first ISSCR 2022 episode. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast to find out what we're up to at the meeting and visit us at the Stem Cell Podcast booth on the exhibitor floor where you can win some prizes and find out how you could be featured on a future episode of the podcast. I already mentioned that. Check back here tomorrow for another episode recapping day two of the meeting, which will be similarly exciting, I can imagine. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, until then, thanks for catching this off uh, episode special of the podcast, and we hope you'll tune in tomorrow for another one.